Hello again. How nice to have you with us. Now, one of the great joys of EASD are the prize lectures. And have we got a prize lecture for you? And it's the EASD Lily Centennial Anniversary Prize Lecture. A lot of words there. Got that right, I think. Uh, and it's been given this year by uh, Matthias Schoep, a legend in diabetes, particularly for his discovery of ghrelin and polyagonist gut hormones. So, Matthias, first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, second, uh, welcome. And th Lily has a very strange involvement with you, <laughs> because I think I'm right in saying that you started out your career at Lily. I mean, you have no connection with them now, but you started out there. In a sense, that's true. It actually feels like Lily's haunting me in some good way. Um, when I was a, a young physician, I, I went out to uh, look for a postdoctoral fellowship and I ended up doing a postdoc at Lily in the, in the 90s of, of the last century. And that was a great experience. You know, we went into these discoveries that ghrelin is the hunger hormone from the stomach, but also I learned a lot about how drugs are being discovered and developed. I left and went back into academia, but uh, when I was at Lilly, I met Richard DiMarchi, my closest collaborator and mentor, and I think there was a trigger point that set off the trajectory that led me to where we are today, and this is a Lilly-sponsored award, if I understand correctly, so somehow the circle comes uh, full. So what happened next? You discovered ghrelin was the hunger hormone, and there was a huge excitement about it at the time but there's a big gap between <laughs> excitement and delivery of drugs. So what happened next? You know, those were exciting times. I mean, obesity was already a big issue and, and type two diabetes, but uh, suddenly we started to discover these molecular underpinnings of the disease. Uh, Jeff Friedman discovered leptin and then there was ghrelin as the opponent. Uh, Steve O'Reilly and others showed that in the brain there's melanocortin system that's being targeted. But none of these things seem to be easily leading to, uh, leading to a therapeutic that would be transformative in the fight against the pandemic of obesity and diabetes. Because I think I remember that leptin, for instance, uh, you know, the whole thing was bought by Amgen and it never worked. It wasn't as easy as it as we thought it would be. Um, so, if you treat with leptin, the word comes from leptus thin. You're not making people thinner, apart from the few that are lacking leptin, because a lot of obese individuals have too much leptin. And it's it's a little bit of the mirror situation with ghrelin, where you would want to stop ghrelin and reduce levels and block at the ghrelin receptor, but obese individuals already have low ghrelin. So both of them weren't very easy entry points for a therapeutic. Still, we learned a lot. From these two, we learned that the brain is the target of these hormones. The brain is an important part of what obesity means and, and to us as a challenge. So we had understood already we need to target the brain. But it became clear piece by piece and step by step, and, and we believed in it early, that a combination therapy was needed, a combination of signals that sort of reached that critical mass that tells the brain we need to change our body weight. So what was the key thing that made you think that a combination therapy would be effective because it's not intuitive right it was relatively quickly after the the, the whole ghrelin research and our attempts to block at the receptor uh, that there was sort of a, a wave of discoveries of other hormones and signals that all sort of contributed to the regulation of body weight and you know when there is such a matrix that the brain seems to recognize then it seemed to us relatively clear that we need to find at least a part of that matrix rather than a single signal that uh, could be the basis for a novel therapeutic. Well, from that insight uh, to today where the first uh, combinatorial drug with tercepatide has been approved by the FDA has been, has been 20 years. And it must, you must be seeing the success of tercepatide with enormous pleasure. I mean, this baby that you launched has really now well, proved exactly what you hoped it would, and, and I suspect more. 
it is really even exceeding our expectations. We always believed in that gut hormone combinations in single molecules are going to be the transformative path toward fighting obesity and diabetes. But what we learn now with all the clinical studies and the approval of tercepatide and other drugs on the heel of that, hopefully being approved in the future and the clinical studies in the same direction, is really exciting. I think there is potential to really, you know, win the fight now against the global obesity and type 2 diabetes pandemic. And where do you think, I mean, you mentioned other, uh, you know, compounds in the pipeline, but where do you think this is going? I mean, do you see this, uh, uh, these treatments being used, you know, early on in disease or even in people who are not yet, you know, clinically diagnosed with diabetes? I absolutely believe that both will be a possibility or even going to be soon a reality. Um, I think the challenges arise from the fact that we need personalized metabolic medicine in the end. And the plurality of new uh, agents that are going to be uh, approved hopefully in the next couple of years offers us that opportunity. But we need to come up with the right diagnostics, you know, which uh, is the right patient for a GLP, GIP, and where do we use glucagon GLP? Where do we need the triple? And for how long? When is it okay and, and sufficient to go back on monoagonist treatment? Lots of questions uh, because uh, there's uh, certainly subpopulations of type 2 diabetes and, and obesity that we start to understand. Now we need to match that with the novel drugs that are on the horizon. Another big challenge are costs right? I mean, this is something that's difficult to influence and, and this is very political, but, you know, uh, this is an opportunity to really end a pandemic. Um, but for that, it needs to be affordable. Somebody yeah. needs, needs to be able to pay for that. Yes. And these drugs don't work the same in everybody, do they? Some people will have really quite dramatic weight loss and others not nearly so much. How do we get to the bottom of that? There's certainly a lot that we still need to understand in terms of uh, mechanistic underpinnings. Um, but there are patterns that you know, s certain um, patients with metabolic disease have more of a fatty liver issue, others have more of an abdo abdominal adipose tissue uh, problem, uh, others again, it's, it's, it's purely how the brain regulates nutrients that are coming in, etc. Et so um, with that as guidance, I think uh, we have a good chance to start the right therapy and the right patients right away, but there's a lot to learn. Um, a few things are clear. We somehow do need to target structures in the brain and the hypothalamus with these drugs. Um, and uh, we have to have a combination of a regulation of appetite and a regulation of how many calories we burn. The sympathetic nervous system is a part of that. So I'm saying that because that plays a role in terms of looking at other drugs these patients may already be receiving that then interact. I think drug interactions, drug-drug interactions is something to be uh, looked at carefully. You've had an extraordinary career, and I guess this lecture really reflected the whole arc of your career. And I wonder, looking back, what lessons you draw from it that you could give to other uh, early career researchers starting out and thinking, what shall I research, what direction shall I take? I have to admit, it does make me a little nervous when you speak of my career in past tense, but because I'm, I'm still a scientist who was actively... <laughs> He's going on for many years, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think there are a number of lessons that start to crystallize after three decades of, of doing this. I think the most important one is to not be too caught up with your own vision or my own vision it's always good to have one but you have to adjust and the other thing is don't be um, too put off by naysayers and, and uh, criticism because when we started this I've wrote some of that down. I mean, if some of the more famous colleagues in the field would say, stop it, you're embarrassing yourself, this combination therapy is that's too complicated, you will never get funded, you'll destroy your career, these kind of things. Well, and today it looks a little bit different. So I think I would, I would summarize uh, as, you know, follow the data is the best advice. Um, good experiments and an unbiased look, fresh, every day at the data, that's what matters and that's what paves the way, not the model that yourself or others may believe in. And that must have been a particularly important thing to hold in mind, kind of in the early years after the discovery of ghrelin, because 
you know, injecting uh, ghrelin does absolutely nothing. It does no, no good. So, you know, it must have been very discouraging at that particular moment. And trying to carry on must have been hard. In, 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 in two ways, uh, you're of course right that there was a little bit of a disappointment after that peak of, wow, the hunger hormone, we found it. But on, on the other hand, um, there is something very unique about the, the excitement in the moment where you discover something. So the moment I saw the, the results uh, that I think the first one really that was so exciting was that uh, ghrelin increases body weight and the other one that ghrelin is regulated by food intake. And I remember today how I see th these numbers coming out of the printer on, on the paper and so you get these goosebumps. Once you experience that, there's something in science where you want to have that again. It is so exhilarating. So that really carries you through, you know, as you can tell, decades of frustration and rejection. Um, so, it, you know, it, but, you know, I've got extremely lucky that I had that moment. And it's not something you can necessarily plan. Um, I guess you've got to be ready for it when it occurs. And have you had a similar kind of moment of reflection and, you know, if not, you know, outwardly, kind of inwardly patting yourself on the back when finally tazepatide was approved? Not patting myself on the back. I mean, in the end, it was a mission, you know, to, to change something transformatively in, in a way that not the only thing that we can offer patients is, you know, calling the surgeon and, and doing a gastric bypass. And that that is possible, that is really the exciting thing, hopefully. And now we're going um, in, in, a, in a decade where that will be uh, an opportunity that, you know, 25, 30 percent weight loss may be possible and you don't need to put a gastric bypass in place. Um, of course, you know, <laughs> After these years of, of trying to convince everybody else that this is reasonable to use combinatorial treatments um, have have been intense and there is it was sort of incremental. I mean, it, be, it became more and more clear this is this might actually work. So there wasn't a single uh, s single moment, but you know it, I'm, I'm just glad that you know this. This will help people. Uh, it looks like it might help in terms of cardiovascular risk, so it really means saving lives. Um, and what, what better could a physician hope for? A perfect way to end our interview. And ladies and gentlemen, you cannot find a better exposition of a discovery right through to its clinical application than the EASD Lilly Anniversary Centennial Prize Lecture. Terrific. Thank awesome. you so much, Matthias, for talking to us. Thanks very much. Bye for now.